There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean Breeze Books. Welcome back to another book haul. I haven't done one of these for a few weeks. I've been kind of... Uh, things have been kind of falling off the edges uh, when I had such a terrible cough for about two months, but I'm um, back in the saddle and let's do another book haul. First up is a, the second novel by, by a Ghanaian British novelist who I have never read, and that is the Small Worlds by Caleb Azuma Nelson. His first novel was Open Water, which I have, I've hauled, uh, haven't read yet. This one published 2023. And it's about fathers and sons, faith and friendship. There are two very short epigraphs. The first one is, Black faith still can't be washed away by Solange. The second one, From my heart, that's the making of me by Dave. Um, I suspect those might actually be characters in this novel. Let's see. Uh, no. So I don't know who those people are. Solange sounds like somebody famous doesn't it? But I don't know. Anyway, here's the opening paragraph. It's quite long. It's almost a full page. Since the one thing that can solve most of our problems is dancing, it only makes sense that here, following the shimmer of black hands raised in praise, the pastor invited us, the congregation, to pray. And we allowed that prayer to make space, allowed ourselves to explore the depths and heights of our beings allowed ourselves to say things which were honest and true, godlike even, allowed ourselves to speak to someone who is both us and the people we want to be, allowed ourselves to speak quietly, which is a call to give up the need to be sure, and ask, when was the last time we surrendered? When was the last time we were this open? And before we could try to answer, the drums start off, sudden and sure. A thick bass line follows, getting to the heart of things. The pianist plays secret chords from the soul. And before the intro is done, the choir magic themselves to the stage. And there's a microphone in hand and a grin as the leader steps down, singing her prayer. I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my shame. She sings these words, knowing that if we're in this room, then we've probably known sorrow, probably known shame. We know death in its multitudes, but we're all very serious about being alive. And since the one thing that can solve most of our problems is dancing, we turn our mourning into movement. We breach the borders of our rows, spilling into the aisles, making our way to the area in front of the stage, making our way into that space. Well, that's gorgeous, and that one phrase just grabbed me. The choir magic themselves to the stage. Next is a book that I've read and, and enjoyed, and I loved it so much it was a library book that I bought a copy. An Ideal Presence by Eduardo Berti. It's a very plain cover. It's quite lovely, but very plain. And it's translated from... Uh, how does this work? The author was born in Buenos Aires, but lives in France, so I can't remember which language it was written in. Let's see if I can figure it out. The only way I can figure it out is to look up what language is the translator translates. Daniel Levin Becker, he is an American writer, translator, and musical critic. He translates from the French. All right. So translated from the French. I bet this book was marvelous. It is kind of like autofiction, but the author himself is not present really too much in the book. Like I say, he lives in France. And he was invited to be kind of like a writer in residence or something like that at a palliative care department in Rouen, France. And he has written and fic fictionalized versions of the stories all the staff there told him. And it's just one of the most heartrending books. There is nothing schmaltzy or sentimental about it. It's just indescribably and fiercely literary and brilliant and soul enlarging. And when I talked about it in my Friday Reads, nobody ever commented on it, so I know that death and dying is a pretty touchy subject, but I really hope some of you will give it a try, because it's, it's one of the most uh, impactful books I read last year. The epigraph is from Proust, Swan's Way. The hope of being relieved gives him the courage to suffer. Here's a short one. It's the third one chapter or whatever. 
I'll read it in its entirety. And this is Camille Zernheld. I'm assuming that all the names have been changed, but I don't know that for sure. It's, it's marketed as a novel, so whatever that means. And she is described as being a nursing aide, and this is her story. Late one afternoon, a Friday, I was with my partner, Awa, and another pair was also on duty. Morgan and Celine, I think. That's how we work here. You've already been told all that, I assume. A nurse and a nursing aide, in tandem. Anyway, it was Friday, as I was saying, and I knew I had the weekend off, that neither Awa nor I would be back at work until Monday. So I took the piece of paper where I usually note down, like a checklist for myself, the names of the twelve patients and each one's room number, and then, all of a sudden, without quite knowing why, I underlined eight names and said, just like that, quickly, in front of my three co-workers, the other four, they won't be here on Monday. I meant, obviously, the patients whose names I hadn't underlined. I had forgotten all of this by Monday, when Celine saw me come in and told me an awful and strange thing. My prediction had come true. Everyone was looking at me, wondering how I could have known. Of course, I hadn't known anything. I'd just guessed. It's crazy. I'd guessed. Now I was rattled and mortified. Needless to say, I've never done anything like that again. Not even for myself in secret. No, never. The next is a book that I heard about on the part one video that Eric Carl Anderson and Anna James put out every year. One of the very first booktube videos I ever watched years ago when I was still living in Japan and long before I ever thought. The audacious thought of launching my own channel was one of their shortlist prediction or whatever. Long list discussion and shortlist prediction. They make, they make it two, I think, two videos every season for the Women's Prize. And I don't even like the Women's Prize because it tends to focus on commercial fiction rather than literary fiction. That's my take on it. Um, although I do find the long list interesting. And in fact, the, the books that don't make it from the long list to the short list, I think those might be worth reading, because usually what is on the short list and certainly what wins is just garbage. Did I say that out loud? So this was one that I think it was Anna that predicted it would be on, and I don't remember now if it did make it. I don't think it did, which is probably a good sign. But the way she described it, it's, it sold me completely, so I ordered it. It's called... Dominoes by Phoebe McIntosh, who I'd never heard of. It's probably, a I think it's a debut. Yep, it's a debut novel. Phoebe McIntosh is a black British actress and playwright. The novel opens a month before a wedding. The bride-to-be is biracial, Jamaican mother, white father. And the groom is a Scotsman. That there's something about history that's not on the back that was what entranced me. Oh, there it is. It's right where I stopped watching the video. Anna said the historical background is that they're, before they get married, they have the same surname. And the premise is that they discover that the groom's white ancestors were slave owners and they owned the bride's paternal black ancestors. Autumn Seuss. Doesn't that sound fascinating? I think this is one I got at a charity shop or something. And it's one I've been hearing about for years. It's a gay novel called Lie With Me by Philippe Besson. It's a French novel, obviously, translated from the French by Molly Ringwald. And it got quite a lot of buzz when it came out, and I found a copy for like two dollars, and I picked it up. The translation is 2019, and the original or novella, 2017, there are two epigraphs. The first is from Marguerite Dorat, the lover. You didn't have to attract desire. Either it was there at first glance, or else it had never been. It was instant knowledge of sexual relationship, or it was nothing. The next is from Brett Easton Ellis, Lunar Park. I concluded with an aching finality that the could happen possibilities were gone, and that doing whatever you wanted was over. The future didn't exist anymore. Everything was in the past and would stay there. I'll read the first few paragraphs, half of which are one short sentence long. It's the playground of a high school, an asphalt courtyard surrounded by ancient gray stone buildings with big tall windows. Teenagers with backpacks or school bags at their feet stand around chatting in small groups. The girls with the girls and boys with boys. If you look carefully, you might spot a supervisor among them 
barely older than the rest. It's winter. You can see it in the bare branches of a tree you would think was dead planted there in the middle of the courtyard, and in the frost on the windows, and in the steam escaping from mouths and the hands rubbing together for warmth. It's the mid-80s. You can tell from the clothes, the high-waisted, ultra-skinny acid-washed jeans, the patterned sweaters. Some of the girls wear woolen leggings in different colors that pool around their ankles. I'm 17 years old. The next one is a, a hand-me-down from my mom. It's a book that she read and very much enjoyed. She and I share a favorite writer. It's a favorite writer of mine of sorts, and that's Helen Humphreys, a Canadian-British writer. She's been living in Britain for a long time, I think. Helen Humphreys, and this is, a, I think, a work of nonfiction called The Frozen Thames. And it's about the River Thames, if you didn't gather that already. Forty vignettes based on historical events between the years 1142, if I can read that small print correctly, and 1895. And there's lots of artwork and so on in it. It's a very it printed on heavy, thick paper. And I was a, I'm a huge admirer of Helen Humphrey's early fiction, but her more recent fiction, I've seen the last five or six years, is just awful. It's unreadable to me. But her nonfiction, past and present, continues to be a, a source of readerly delight for yours truly. There's nothing that has a standalone vitality, so I'll just leave it at that. But this is something that I think I'd be of my reading life and I should buddy read sometime. And finally, this is a work of Saskatchewan fiction that was highly recommended to me by the Alberta writer, Betty Jane Hagerit. She was my mystery guest back in January, and she passionately recommended this novel. It's called A Book of Great Worth by Dave Margoshis. Dave Margoshis is an American-Canadian writer who has lived in Saskatoon for decades and decades. He is a very close confidant, very close literary friend of David Carpenter. So I hear about him all the time from Dave Carpenter. I have met him once briefly. He is partnered with the Saskatchewan Poet Laureate D. Hobsbawm Smith, who I have talked about on this channel and have yet to interview, but look forward to interviewing her someday. And and this is the book that uh, um, Betty Jane Hagerit said is his masterpiece. So I found it at um, a used bookstore, and it was published in 2012. It's a book about a father's life told through the son's memories. And so I think it's quite autobiographical. Set largely among the Jewish community of intra-war New York City. Okay, sounds fascinating. I'll read the first short section of the first chapter, if they are chapters. It's called The Proposition. I did something stupid, the rabbi told my father. It was 1925, New York City, a bar on the Lower East Side. My father was a few years away from marriage, fatherhood, respectability, and so was prone to do stupid things himself. Stay up late, associate with rough customers, drink too much, sing off key, which really was the only way my father knew how to sing. But a rabbi doing a stupid thing? And not just any rabbi, but his good friend Lev Bronston, who was more like a big brother to him than any of his own big brothers were. I'm not joking, Harry, Bronston said. I mean really stupid. He took a sip of whiskey. It involves a woman. Ah, my father said. It's bad, Harry, the rabbi said. Bronson had a long, often damp nose and prominent ears, which combined to make his head appear larger than normal. He shook it now. Very bad. All right, which one of these would you be most inclined to try first? Thanks for watching.